Well, good morning and welcome to a first for many of us. We're pre-recording this sermon as for the, for the members and the friends of First Baptist Church in Williamston, Michigan. And I want to give a big thanks to Pastor Ken here at, at Bethel Baptist in, in Jackson and Pastor Patrick who's set up a lot of this and Dave Reverts who's on the soundboard and tech team for uh, making this all possible so that we can broadcast this to our congregation uh, in Williamston. And I, even though I'm preaching to a mostly empty auditorium this morning here at Bethel, I can just imagine your faces out there as you sit in the congregation in Williamston. And I know where you typically sit, and you're in my mind as we preach this. This morning, we're continuing our series in the book of Philippians. So if you have your Bibles, let me encourage you to turn to Philippians chapter 3, and let's get into this. Um, there is, they tell me, a logic to accounting practices. Accountants have told me this, and I accept it by faith. Um, my wife's son-in-law, Dan, is really smart, and he just finished years of postgraduate education to get his CPA, and he's learned the intricacies of the discipline. So I don't feel too badly about not understanding accounting because my only training in the discipline was a business course I took when I was a freshman in high school. When it comes to understanding account ledgers, I don't get it. I mean, my eyes just glaze over. When I was doing some work with CB America, I sit, had to sit down with their accountant and say, would you explain to me what this debit credit ledger look means as I read these figures because I couldn't make any sense out of it. it. Took me the longest time even to figure out that if a figure is in parentheses it's a negative figure. It means we're in the red that much. I'm pretty basic. I'm, uh, I, I want to know three things. How much do we have? How much did we spend? And how much is left over? I have an a, approximate balance for my checkbook and that's about as complex as I get. You know, financial profit loss calculations um, can be complex, but then how do we step back and, and evaluate those areas of our lives that are less tangible? Well, what is profitable and what do we write off as, lot, as loss? And how do we balance those books and come to some sense of where we are and especially how, where we are spiritually? Well, in the opening verses of Philippians chapter 3, the Apostle Paul talked about how he measured personal profit and loss. And listen to what he says in the first eight verses. Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you is no trouble to me, and it's safe for you. Look out for the dogs. Look out for the evildoers. Look out for those who mutilate the flesh. For we are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God and the glory of Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. Though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also, if anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law of Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. Paul begins this extraordinary passage with a call to joy. And we talked about that last week. Rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you is no trouble to me. It's safe for you. This is a good thing. Uh, Paul urges us to turn our thoughts to what Jesus did on the cross, thanking him for so great salvation, anticipating the, the, the glory that awaits. Even in the face of difficult circumstances for us today, in the face of an encroaching global pandemic, as we redirect our hearts to gratitude for what God has done and is doing in us, what we anticipate when we stand before him, God's spirit meets us with joy. That's just extraordinary. The apostle Peter put it this way, in this you rejoice. 
Though now for a little while, if necessary, you've been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it's tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And though you not, do not see him now, you believe in him and rejoice with joy inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Joy is a mark of spiritual vitality in growing Christians who cling tenaciously to the faith. But then hard up against this call to rejoice in the Lord, which is a good thing, and we want to do that, comes this next verse, just out of the blue, look out for the dogs, look out for the evildoers, look out for those who mutilate the flesh. And there's almost like a mental whiplash, like, Paul, what in the world? Where did you go? How did this show up? Well, we have to remember that Paul is a man just like us, and he's an older man, like I am. And sometimes when I'm talking, thoughts come in out of the blue and pop out in my conversation because it's, what I've said has reminded me of something else, and I just go in a different direction, and people sitting there listening to me say, what? Where, where did this come from? And, and understand that Paul is dictating this letter. Uh, he's got an amanuensis, a scribe, who's writing down what Paul is saying. That was a common practice in that day. And he's, he's come to a new section in the letter. He wants to talk about joy, and he's going to come back to it in chapter 4. But his thought about joy is interrupted as he remembers these, these troubling interlopers who might rob them of joy. And Paul is really concerned about, in fact, he uses some pretty vicious language, stuff that we probably would not want to say today. His words are terse. They're, they're biting. Look out for the dogs. Look out for the evildoers. Look out for those who mutilate the flesh. Why? Because they rob your joy. They're as dangerous as the voracious canines that roam the streets of the city, scavenging for scraps and even attacking people. These pretend to be righteous and good, but they practice evil. So who's he talking about? Well, there were Jewish Christians in those days who taught that in order to be genuinely saved, you had to be circumcised and keep the whole Jew Mosaic law. Good Christians had to be good rule keepers. And Paul had run into them early on in his ministry after he had returned from his fish, first missionary journey and gone back to Antioch, and he tells the church about what had been happening and how God had been seeing Gentiles come to faith in Jesus Christ. Um, they showed up, and they confronted Paul over in Acts chapter 15, if you want to turn there. Acts 15 um, Luke writes, but some men came down from Judea and were teaching the brothers here at Antioch now, unless you're circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. And after Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and debate with them, Paul and Barnabas and some of the others were appointed to go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and elders about this question. So being sent on their way by the church, they passed through both Phoenicia and Samaria, describing in detail the conversion of the Gentiles, and brought great joy to all the brothers. When they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and the elders, and, and they declared to them all that God had done with them. But some believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees rose up and said, it is necessary to circumcise them and to order them to keep the law of Moses. The church in Jerusalem, as they're confronted with this challenge, responded to it by convening a church council. It was the first church council. There were several others throughout those early centuries as, as the church began to grapple with truth and what the gospel was and who Jesus was and all of those other things. But here, they're talking about the essence of the gospel. And, and this council rejected law-keeping as contrary to the grace of God in Christ. But the error persisted, and those who uh, couldn't let go of the idea that Gentiles could be saved by grace through faith uh, began to spread out and spread this heresy, and Paul tangled with them throughout his ministry. 
Scholars today call them Judaizers because they seriously believed and taught that in order to be saved, you had to keep the old covenant restrictions of the law. They didn't understand the freedom that Christ came to bring. And for them, Christianity was an exercise in becoming outwardly righteous, filled with lists of things to do or to avoid doing. They're still around today. For them, it began with circumcision. For us, it begins with other things. For instance, and, and we'll talk about circumcision first and come back to that. Circumcision had become for the Jews at that time a very special mark of faithfulness to God because God had given it to Israel originally as a sign of the covenant. This is how every Jewish male was set apart for God, for Israel. All Jewish males were to be circumcised, cutting off a piece of the flesh to indicate their separation to God. Some 200 years before Paul is writing this, uh, a, a, a king arose in the Middle East called Antiochus Epiphanes. He had come to power, he had conquered Palestine, and he was determined to stamp out the worship of God in Israel. He sacrificed a pig on the altar in Jerusalem, and he made circumcision a capital offense. And as a result, Faithful Jewish parents chose death rather than forsake God's covenant. And circumcision was just elevated to a mark of confessional faithfulness, a mark of true Jewish believers, as well as a sign of God's covenant with Israel. So it's not hard to understand that when Christ began his church and Gentiles began to be saved, many Jewish Christians, especially those who had come from the Pharisees, who prided themselves on obedience and faithfulness to the law, had a hard time accepting that since Jesus had inaugurated a new covenant by his blood, circumcision was no longer necessary. They just couldn't bridge that gap. And they remained zealous for the Mosaic law and demanded that Gentile converts to Christianity be circumcised and follow the Mosaic law in every respect. And that led to a perversion of the Christian faith that celebrated obedience to the code of the law. What you wore, what you ate, how you organized your schedule, your calendar, everything else. And those who taught such things, like all legalists, became proud of their spiritual accomplishments. And Christians who were trapped by the lie shouldered the enormous burden of a try-harder Christianity in which there was little room for spontaneous joy because you always wondered if you were doing enough, if you were doing it right, if you were measuring up. Paul calls such people dogs, which is an interesting term because for faithful Jews, the Gentiles were the dogs. And Paul, writing to a Gentile church, calls them dogs. Spiritually, those who demanded obedience to the law were the real unclean predators of the human race. They're evildoers. They were determined to be righteous by means of rigid, rigid compliance to rules and laws, but they turned people away from the simplicity and the freedom of faith in Jesus. And Paul warned about the mutilation to demand circumcision after Christ was merely to mutilate the body. It had no impact on our standing with God. Christians, Paul says, are the true circumcision whose hearts bear the mark of God's covenant. Christians worship by means of the Spirit who energizes our devotion to God and our own spirits to respond to our Heavenly Father. We don't worship in the arrogance generated by fulfilling man-made regulations. We boast in Jesus and what he has done for us, not for our own accomplishments. People like those first century Judaizers still exist. They aren't necessarily trying to take us back to the laws of Moses, but they are taking, back, taking us back to a system of rules and laws by which Christians live their lives. Sometimes they're called Christian standards. But they're moralizing rules as the measuring stick for who's in and who's out. For instance, before Susie and I got married, her daughter Megan had dyed her hair purple, and it was great. Um, <laughs> it was really purple, and it was really fun. But her, the first Sunday, she went to church with a new hairdo, with purple hair. She got a 
visit from the pastor's wife who took her to task for her worldliness because she had dyed her hair purple. And we got all kinds of things like that that we set up as rules that mark who's Christian, who's not, who's spiritual, who's not. When I was a kid, I remember there was a man who attended our church who had a Sunday school pin on his, on his coat. And for those of you who, younger, who are younger don't know, they used to have pins and then annual little things that you could hang on that pin that told how many years you had um, gone to Sunday school without missing a Sunday. And this guy had a Sunday school pin up here and then a list of banners underneath that that went halfway to his waist. And I, I don't know what was in his heart, but as I looked at him, I remember as a kid thinking, man, it, it looks like he's prouder about his perfect Sunday school attendant for decades than he is about the fact that Jesus Christ saved him by means of the cross. Paul says true believers aren't marked by these external things. They're marked by three things. They worship and serve God by the Spirit. They boast in Jesus. They aren't impressed with themselves and their own spiritual accomplishments. And they place no confidence in their human abilities to fulfill what God requires. When Paul wrote the church at Ephesus, he said this, and this is a familiar passage to most of you, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It's the gift of God, not the result of work, so that no one can boast. The men Paul warned about were impressed with themselves and their accomplishments and their spirituality and their obediences and all these other things. And so Paul goes on and he says, all right, I'll go toe-to-toe -to -toe with you on that basis. If you want to talk about religious accomplishments, if you're proud of what you have achieved, let's compare. Look at verse 4 again through verse 6. Though I, oh, well, yeah. Though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also, if anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. Now, Paul had it all. Before his conversion, he was no slouch. He'd reached the pinnacle of religious attainment in Judaism. He was born to Jewish parents, circumcised the eighth day following precisely the law of Moses. He was a Pharisee like his father before him. He had, a, he re, had a religious pedigree that was impeccable. And the Pharisees were strictly religion. They had bound themselves to obey all of God's 613 laws. And if you didn't know, there are 16, 613 laws in the Old Testament. 365 of them are negative. 248 of them are positive. And the Pharisees had not only listed all those laws, they had carefully defined and described what it meant to keep those laws. For instance, you couldn't do work on a Sabbath. And one of the ways they defined work on the Sabbath, for instance, ladies, if you were sewing on Friday and you're stitching something up and you get done and you just kind of stuck that pin in, the, in your, your robe and went about your business and forgot about it and the sun went down and you still got that pin in your robe, you'd broke broke the Sabbath because you were doing work because you were carrying that pen. Now that's how detailed they got about observing the law. And Paul could say with absolute integrity, if you'd examined my life by all the religious, religious leaders said were important, I was blameless. I had learned to order my life in strict conformity to the written code, not only what God said, but also about what the Pharisees said about what God said. He kept all of it. And his zeal for obedience drove him actively to persecute the church. He took the lead in arresting and hounding Christians who he perceived as dangerous heretics who perverted the law. Nobody in Jerusalem could match Paul in zeal and scrupulous obedience to the minutia of the law, in religious attainment or in religious pedigree. If there had been an Oscar for religious performance, Paul would have won hands down. That mattered most to him more than anything else until he met Jesus Christ. 
He goes on to say, but whatever gain I, I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. All of that stuff that Paul did as a Pharisee, everything that made him stand out as a man, Everything on the ledger of his life that he valued and treasured as profitable was trashed when he met Jesus on the road to Damascus. Compared with the surpassing greatness of his personal acquaintance with Jesus Christ, everything else was, in accounting terms, in parentheses. Paul calls it rubbish. Our translators have kind of sanitized that term, rubbish. Um, in, in Paul's day, it could refer to the trash, what I took out Wednesday evening for the garbage man to pick up the next morning. It could mean that. But, but it's also a word that could be crude and to our taste today almost vulgar. The Greek word is skubala. It just sounds nasty, doesn't it? Skubala. <laughs> skubala was a word you might use if you were out and you'd just run across a kind of a, a rotting, half-eaten corpse of an animal, or a pile of garbage that was just stinking and oozing with all kinds of nasty stuff in there. That's skubala. It's even the kind of word that you, you might have used if you were talking about what a farmer tried to avoid stepping in when he's out in the cow pasture. It's that kind of a word. Paul is really earthy here. Whatever gain I had, I'd account as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as skubala <laughs> in order that I may gain Christ. And here we come to a point of special significance to us. What might you be trusting to commend you to God apart from what Jesus Christ has already done for you on the cross? that you're basically a good person? Your hard work, your record of church attendance and service, your giving, your daily devotion, your moral scruples, what commends you to God? What's more important to you than knowing Jesus Christ? Your investments, your house, your reputation, your recreations, your relationships? That, that's a hard question to answer, honestly, for all of us. On the, on the ledger of your life, on those columns marked profit and loss, where do you put Jesus and where do you put everything else? And on that final day of accounting, when you stand before God and the books are open, what will you do if you discover that you traded the opportunity of knowing the Son of God for what is, by comparison, a pile of scupala? God has given us many good things to enjoy in this life. But at the end, we leave them all behind. And only Christ will get you into heaven. Above everything else that matters to you, whatever you pursue, pursue him. There is no comfort in being the richest man in hell or the best athlete or the best looking or the most popular, or any of those other things that we think are so important in this world. When we stand before God, everything that we prize more than Jesus is going to be seen in parentheses <laughs> by comparison. A debit that we exchange for life's ultimate acquisition, a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. In this time of unprecedented uncertainty, doesn't it make uncommonly good sense to take stock of where we stand spiritually? Paul had it figured out. Whatever I counted as gain, whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss. I just reckon it that way. Because of the surpassing worth of knowing Jesus Christ my Lord, for his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. What a great word. What a, what a, 
What a great prize to seek after and pursue. Several years ago, a good friend of mine, Sherry Carlson, who attends our church here as well, uh, recorded a cover of a Larnell Harris song called, I Want to Know Christ. And, and this, this is just a portion of the lyrics. I know that my path is the way of the cross, so I count what I gain and forget what I've lost. In pain, there's joy. In death, there's life. Dear God, hear my cry. I want to know Christ. I want to know Christ. I, I, I keep him before me. I lift up my eyes. I drink in his glory. I press towards the goal. His goodness unfolds. March on, oh my soul. I want to know Christ. That's my prayer for us this morning, that we want to know Christ, that that is the goal of our lives, to know him and the power of his resurrection. Paul is going to come back to this, and we're going to look at that as we continue to go through this passage. But to make Christ the surpassing worth of knowing him first in our hearts, would you pray with me? Father, I thank you for the gift of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God who died for us, who took our blame and our guilt and our shame and paid for it all on the cross so that he could give to us his life and his goodness and his righteousness so that we could be welcomed into your family. I pray, God, that you would put the passion in our heart to know Christ above all things and to make him our delight and our reward compared to whom everything else is just trash. Give us a heart for your heart, Father, to pursue you. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Well, I trust you enjoy the rest of a good morning. And have a wonderful Lord's Day. Continue to pray for one another. Call each other. Encourage each other. And we'll look forward to seeing you the next time.